I'd really like you, the, the South Africa, to hear the story about uh, Johan yeah, van Laarhoven. Johan van Laarhoven, you could say he had the first first ever coffee shop in the south of the Netherlands. Nothing that, uh, so the, the very first one in the country was in Utrecht, actually. Most people would say Amsterdam, but it's not. And Amsterdam, of course, very important. But this guy started up already in 1981, first in the south. Oh, Let me show you how he actually began. He started out asking a few old ladies who were in a normal coffee shop, just selling coffee and cakes, if he uh, would be allowed to sell some uh, hash from their basement. And they were progressive old ladies, so they didn't mind. And th that's how we got a start in his hometown of Tilburg, uh, which is very close to my own town, about 25 kilometers from here. And from there on, he just built his brand. He's really a self-made man, uh, not much on the ed education side, but he's a very savvy businessman, and he loves wheat, and he knows wheat. Uh, so what he did was um, build out this, this first tiny little coffee shop into a chain, of four coffee shops in two uh, cities, and he did really well. He called the company the Grass Company. Uh, he also got into his own uh, brand of rolling papers. He had a, a, a big uh, business on the side of that, so he did really well. And his second home, by then already, was Thailand. He really, really, I should now use the past tense, he loved Thailand, because I don't think he'll love it anymore. Yeah. So he married a Thai uh, lady there. He spent all his holidays there. In 2011, he sold the whole company, and he could make, of course, a good price of it because it was making a lot of money. So then he had some money to buy a nice house in Phuket, in Thailand, and live there with his wife. They have two small children together. Everything was great, but only for three years, because like you said, indeed, in 2014, this story really broke. He was arrested in a big, big raid that was actually televised live on Thai television. He had like uh, 80 cops in his house. They took him away, and the screaming children were there, they took his wife Tukta away. And only later we really found out what had prompted this arrest, and then the story gets uh, scary, really, I would say. It turns out that already from the start that he sold his business in 2011, the Dutch authorities are invis investigating Johan van Laro and the grass company. And they have a few of these investigations where they really try hard. If you are, have a big business and you are very, uh, you are open, out in the open with it, they want to pull you down because that's the really the repressive trend that we've been having here in the country now for 20 years. So he was a prime target. Problem was, the guy has a clean slate. He was never, he has no criminal record whatsoever. All his coffee shops are run exactly the way you should run a coffee shop here in Holland, so he kept, he stick to all the rules. They couldn't get anything on the guy. Now, we can say in retrospect, one of the prosecutors got totally obsessed by this whole case and by not being able to nail Johan Vallaar over, and he thought, well, he's living in, uh, in Thailand now, maybe I should write a letter to the, to the Thai <coughs> authorities there. There you should know that there has been a military coup in Thailand, in the, in the spring of 2014, so a few months before he was arrested. So they gave the information to the, to the Thai military government that had just done a coup in Thailand. First letter, they said, we are investigating Johan van Lano for large-scale drug dealing. Wow. His wife, Tukke, is a witness to all this drug dealing that has been going on, the whitewashing. But after the letter, nothing really happened. The Thai didn't do anything. So they sort of upped the ante and made it even worse. They wrote a new letter saying, could you please also start an investigation into this couple? Because now the wife took that. She's no longer just a witness. She's an accomplice, we think, to the large-scale drug dealing. No mention of tolerance policy. No mention of coffee shops over 40 years. No mention that he had license for every operation that he ever ran. So yeah, it wasn't really not a big surprise if you know about these letters that they think we have a Pablo Escobar right here in Phuket. We're going to nail this guy. That's why they did it on live TV. <coughs> so to make a very long story a bit shorter, he was sentenced to 103 years in jail. Wow! His wife was sentenced to <laughs> 17 years year. in jail. Yes. <coughs> no matter how hard he fought and how good a lawyer, because he got some really good Dutch lawyers on the side, of course, he's a rich man, it didn't do him much good. They just throw him in there. And the Thai jail, as you mentioned, it's a very different from the Dutch jail, and even, I think, very different from the South African jails. Yeah. 
You're in there on 50 square meters with 50 guys. Johan told me in a letter that one day one of the guys in his cell died. They left him there 24 hours. And it's warm. There's no toilet. You, get, you have a bucket for the 50 men there. You have no bed. You sleep on the concrete floor. That's it. So terrible. Terrible. A lot of his friends and family really feared as the years went by from 2014 on, Johan will die in jail. The Dutch government will have this death on their conscience. Because by now, it has been in the papers here in Holland, he was fucked over by the Dutch government. But it took so long because most people, even in Holland, even I would say, people who smoke weed, a lot of them, they are super cynical about this. They sort of going, yeah, this guy, he made a lot of money with the weed. Shouldn't have gone to Thailand. Oh, Very yeah. stupid. Yeah. There's uh, always those people around. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. If you look social media, yeah. you are you. Yeah. It makes me angry to see people react like that. Mm -hmm. But okay, there has been one member of parliament here in Holland, and we work closely with a, with my organization uh, VOC here for for the activism for legalization. She was the one member of parliament out of 150 that really from the start uh, uh, went for this case. She kept asking the minister questions. She kept giving interviews about the case. This was, of course, very, very important that not only weed smoking activists like myself tried to do something about this terrible drama, but also just a good member of parliament. She managed, together with, with activists, with the family of Johan, to have our national, national ombudsman, which is an authoritative figure, do an investigation into the case just last year, so it took a while, you know, almost five years into it. But then, of course, you know, he looked, he looked into the case. His conclusions were crystal clear. The government has made a lot of mistakes here. They lost the, totally the perspective of the couple and what would happen if you start sending these letters. So then the, the, we got more hopes here in Holland for Johan after that conclusion of the Ombudsman. And there was a debate in April last year, and I watched it live, and it was very special because by now we have a different Minister of Justice, who is a Christian kind of right-wing kind of a guy who is not uh, enthusiastic about weed. But you could see in the debate that he was touched. He received personal letters that Johan has, 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 has written from his jail, explaining his situation and really pleading for his life to the minister. So he said in the debate he was really touched by this, and that he would try very hard, and that he would also consult his colleagues in Thailand to get some sort of resolution to this case. So he went in August, August last year. This was a, was a new thing. I think never ever in our history as a Minister of Justice flown over to a country like that, you know, to plead the case for a guy who's been sentenced. So then it got uh, silent. There were some newspapers reporting he might be home before Christmas. Christmas came and went. He was still in there. And then quite surprised, everybody was quite surprised on, the, on January 16th, so exactly two weeks ago, he was put on the plane and then it was on the news that he was, that he was already on the plane. So then he was coming to Holland. Uh, what was uh, interesting maybe when he came to Schiphol Airport, of course his brother was waiting there for him, Frans van Laren over, wow. who has been in the media a lot of course fighting for his brother and, and, and took the wife as well. They were not even allowed to shake hands at the airport after five and a half years. And uh, Frans was, of course, quite uh, saddened by this fact. But to, to put it in, in perspective, I really think that the Dutch government, and especially the minister who went over to Thailand personally, he wanted uh, to prevent having any kind of pictures of moving images of, of Johan van Laren over returning to the Netherlands in any kind of a triumphant way or, or showing the emotions, we, we can't have that. Because, as you mentioned, his wife is still in there. Right. She's a Thai citizen, she's not Dutch. So there's still some diplomacy has to be done to get her back to the Netherlands as well. Right. So now Johan van Laro, he was, he was transferred the same day to uh, the, 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 the most maximum security prison we have, which is crazy, you know, there's terrorists in there. Now they put just a coffee shop guy in there. The, the, the lawyers tried to get him that he could at least be in hospital for a few days, you know, after this terrible ordeal. No, the judge said, not going to hospital, stay in the maximum security prison. So that, to me, also shows that they really want to do everything to have the outside image, especially to Thai authorities. Yeah, we're not uh, letting him off easy, da-da-da-da-da. And, of course, 
for Yoram personally, this uh, this is this is totally a step forward. And the situation going forward now, if they don't do any kind of an amnesty, he would still have to be in jail in Holland for 16 months. But of course, if you compare it to the 103 years that he has gotten in, uh, in 2015, that's a breeze, of course. So the, the, there was a lot of joy, and uh, and and the, 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 the bad thing about it, the, the black uh, side of it is, is, of course, Tukta is still in jail there in Thailand. So yeah, we, we as as VOC, we're also trying to uh, get out this message. Don't forget Tukta. You know, she's still there. She had nothing to do with any of the golf shops anyway, ever. So she's really the biggest victim, you could say. And, but the minister just he did say uh, after the after the after Johan came to Holland that he will also still be trying to get uh, took that to the Netherlands. So right. the story ain't over yet. So d d did you know okay. Johan as he was starting this in the eighties? Have you been a friend of his all along? No, I only met Johan once, but it was a crazy afternoon, a day really, I should say, that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. <laughs> Because uh, this guy is a larger than life uh, character, and he took me all around Tilburg that day. He showed me the whole bit, where he started, where he was building the new wholesale company for his papers and the grinders and all his business. It wasn't there yet. He, he walked around. I'll never forget this. It was, it was huge. It was in a normal residential area, but he said, you see that tree over there? It's way over there. He said, that's where the end of the building will be. He said, I'll build a nice basement into it, and there I'll make my own private coffee shop, where I'll just have the pool table, I have a nice bar, you can smoke some weed. If clients come to buy some uh, some papers, yeah, we need to welcome them right like like we should. And then when we went to his like, flagship store in Tilburg, it's really, if you ever visit Holland, be sure to go to this coffee shop, because you've never seen anything like it, not even in Amsterdam. They have a full menu with real nice food. You can smoke while you're eating, before you're eating, you order the food. It's such a fantastic place. The, de the decor is fantastic. The, the, this is really, you can see that this is 30 years of coffee shop experience. Right. And then building a coffee shop that will be the ideal coffee shop on any level. It's fantastic. And then when, when he showed me around there, I showed the kitchen, it's like two floors. It's, wow. it's right uh, in the same street as the central station of Tilburg, super visible location. And then he said to me in, uh, in Dutch, Je begrijpt wel, Dirk, die zaak is men een sterve pig. That would translate to, of course you understand, Dirk, this, this one coffee shop here, the big one, it is my big erect penis. <laughs> <laughs> And he liked waving it in the face of, of police officers and anybody who's ever said to him, ah, you never get away with this one, uh, Johan. So this was the way he operated, you know. He okay. didn't have any false modesty. But to me, uh, he made a big impression. And you could just see in the coffee shops, this guy knows how to run coffee shops. And he, he, he's not afraid to tell people I make money selling weed because he believes there's nothing wrong in selling good weed. And right. I agree with him. Completely. Well, I imagine that now he's back in Holland, he might be in maximum security, but I imagine there's no more bucket and there's still and there's a bed, and maybe the bed's yeah, got totally. a blanket, you know. So it's you, he's come back to a humane prison. It's a it, it must be a yeah. huge difference for him, and really, um, he's a strong guy. He know? must be. That's where he's from. You, you know, have to be strong to build you know, like he, that from the eighties. So yeah. they won't. It's good that they they didn't get him down. You know. You, it, it at the end of your Leafly article, there's a, a, there's a um, quote by him that says that he, fe he fears for his mind. His mind's a jumbled mess cause, yeah. because yeah. of the amount of mental torture day in, day out. He can't fix his sentences properly. He can't think straight. So the, I would imagine being in a, 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 in a, tie, in a, in a Holland jail will do something about that. Maybe things will normalize for him as time goes on. Hopefully. I think so. He's, he's understandably, he's very angry. He's very angry. Well, well obviously. <laughs> well, I imagine, yeah, right. I have to have a way to deal with that, of course. Oh, but nice for the... Well, well. Um, I hope our viewers and everybody that will subsequently watch this as the weeks go by now understand about this crazy story. Tell me that the, the original Minister of Justice that did all of this, is he or she still a politician? 
Are they still in government? No. 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 This was the, we, had, we had our monster of Frankenstein justice minister, the guy was called Ivo Opstelten. And he was just the total, the total worst guy we ever had since the, since uh, we started. Wow! And so to, he had to leave after a scandal involving uh, a secret uh, deal with a hash uh, dealer. Actually, <laughs> right. yes, that's so it. Really <laughs> wow! Well, the politician is just a politician here. It's the same the it's world global. over, obviously. And yep. it's, the weirdest stories. Out. And this new guy, like I said, he's a Christian guy, but to, we have different Christians. I don't know how it works over there in South Africa. Oh, no. I would say it's Brandon, the same. He's, uh, he, he sort of goes for the, for, the, for the honesty, you know, and for the empathy and for the humanism that's also in the, in the Bible. But We've got this um, other guy. This other guy would never, ever, ever have flown to Thailand for your own Vlado. No, no way. No so, way. Yeah. You, you can see that it's got... Also with the activism, there's this website people can also visit it, justiceforjohan.nl. That's in English as well, that has all, all documents and letters of Johan if you want to know more about right. the case. But it's, in a way, of course, it's very satisfying because we started with the Justice for Johan campaign working together with his brother from the early, early start. At the Cannabis Liberation Day, I, I read the letter out of Johan to get it on the agenda, to get people talking about it. But hey, if the guy is rotting away in jail and, and you're doing all this work and you're trying and trying, then after all five and a half years to have the guy at least returning back to Holland, yeah, it was a good feeling, of course. Ah, oh, very good feeling. Well, you alerted us to it with that really good uh, article in Leafly magazine. Congratulations Thank on you. that article. It, it's, yeah. it's gone far and wide. It, it's done Johan the power of good, I'm sure. Now South Africa knows about it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for bringing us up to date with this particularly shitty story that ends up about prohibition. How it could possibly... I would like to come back one day and tell more happy story. Maybe we could do that. Eh? Yeah. Oh, no, we'll, 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 tell me a uh, happy story. Are we gonna, we're, there's quite a contingent going to Spanabis this year from South Africa. Are you going to be at Spanabis? I'll be there a whole week, and I'll be announcing something very special uh, that will be happening this year. All righty. Oh, well, cool. we'll catch up with Myrtle and I'll be there and a whole bunch of other South Africans. So we'll see you Fantastic. at Spanabis in a few weeks' time, Derek. Thank you so much for joining us on the Hotbox Show, matey. Thanks, really Derek. appreciate it. it see you honor. soon. Cool, man. Bye-bye. See Cheers. you. Jesus, can you so... believe just weed? It's just about weed. That dude is going to have PTSD for or like... Yeah. It's going to take some serious work to get control of that. Hell of a thing. Good feed. He had a nice microphone, eh? <laughs>